chapter 15. Uh, we, and, and I'm not sure uh, what I will do after this one tonight, but uh, a couple weeks, a couple sessions ago, I did a session on the key to all of life, or the purpose of life is bearing fruit. We took a whole evening showing, demonstrating that from the word of the Lord. And then last week we did part two that talked about how to bear fruit. In order to bear fruit, you have to abide. So tonight's question is how do you abide? Or what is the key to abiding? John 15 and 10. If, everybody say if, you keep my commandments, ye shall abide in my love. Even as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love, skip down to verse 14, you are my friends if, everybody say if, you do whatsoever I command you. So the key to abiding is tonight part three. And the key is obeying. Everybody say obeying. Now there's something about the word obeying that strikes terror into the heart <laughs> of a lot of people. As a matter of fact, I'm, I'm almost to the place this new year where I'm, I may adjust our, just a slight adjustment to the wedding vow because that, to make it, well, it is biblically appropriate already, but the word obey just scares the daylights out of people. <laughs> and it shouldn't. Because the idea of obeying and abiding is a God-ordained law. Uh, it's a rule of life. And either, as with all rules of God, either we work it or it will work us. If a farmer obeys uh, the laws of nature, he will abide in a harvest. If a scientist or an engineer will abide in the laws of physics. He will accomplish great goals, such as creating electricity or making a huge jumbo jet fly. Everything within me tells me when I look at one of those planes sitting on a tarmac, there ain't a way in the world that thing can fly. If you've ever stood next to one, the wheels are tall, as tall as a man. <laughs> They're huge. And you think, how can this thing fly? It, it, it's just, well, normally it can't. But you see, there's, there's other laws besides the law of gravity. <laughs> and if you operate the laws right, it can make jets fly. And every day by obeying other laws, they do. Day in, day out. But if you break these laws, they will break you. Amen? Uh, if you're going to jump off your roof, you're going to get hurt. <laughs> because you're not, in, you're, you're not operating any other laws to, to combat it. Look up Matthew, or bring up on screen Matthew 21. Jesus was talking about himself. And he said, Whosoever shall fall on this stone shall be broken, but on whomsoever it shall fall, it will grind him to powder. He said, It's all about how you react with Jesus, the, the rock of ages. He said, if you fall on the rock, if you do it right, it, 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 you will become broken. And it's, he meant it in a good way. You'll surrender. You'll yield yourself. But if it has to fall on you, it will not just break your will, but it will crush you. Because just like Eve imposed her will over God's will in the garden, and that's really what this is about. And because of that, instead of becoming broken, she became broke. Grounded out of the garden. The question is, why? Because the end result is going to be determined by preconceived choices. God ordained that obedience was the key to abiding, and that abiding is the key to bearing fruit. And consistent obedience to God's principles and God's laws will always produce fruit in our life 
if given enough time. We have to give it enough time. I, I want you to think about this for a minute. God obeys his own laws. And it's a good thing. He works through preset laws that he established. Now, every once in a while, he will bring a higher law into being and, and, and will override a natural law with what we call a supernatural law. But for the most part, he abides by his laws. And even when he uses the supernatural, he still is. It's just we don't have access to the supernatural as, as strongly, obviously, as he does. So what we call the laws of science or the laws of nature, really, it's just God's laws. It's God's rules that he put in. And the consistency of the universe is, is nothing short of amazing. And because of it, we have learned that we can split atoms. We can chart locations by the stars. We can chart DNA in a human being. And all kinds of cool stuff that happens to us that blesses our day-to-day -day life. But all of it is dependent on the consistency of God's laws. And if God ever stops obeying his laws, then the world just collapses. Because God in the beginning said, let there be, and there was. And the only reason there still is, is because he hasn't said anything else to it. <laughs> it's still obeying him over all of this time, uh, up until the time of the flood. And God made a departure from his laws during the flood and brought in a horrific reorganization of the earth during that time. And, he, and on that occasion, he did break his natural laws with supernatural laws. But, but even at that, bring up Genesis 8. Listen to what God said about it when it was all said and done. He spoke to Noah in verse 21. And he said, the Lord smelled a sweet savor, and the Lord said in his heart. This is God made a decision this day. I will not again curse the ground anymore for man's sake. For the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth, and neither will I again smite anymore every living thing as I have done. And then verse 22. Now, literally what he is saying is, I am not going to make the lesser kingdoms pay any more price for the rebellion of mankind. I'm going to hold humans directly responsible for it. But then he said, as a side result of this, verse 22, the good news is, while the earth remaineth, seed time and harvest and cold and heat and summer and winter and day and night shall not cease. And sometimes, like this week, you get all of them in one week's time. <laughs> <laughs> we got cold and heat and summer and winter all, <laughs> all happening together. <laughs> but here's the thing, you can count on it. I am not going to sleep tonight fretting and worrying about the world. Now I'm worried about the lost. But we can chart stars by the fact that, that they are, con we can make charts, excuse me, by the stars because the rotation of the planet is set. That's what he means when he said seed time and harvest. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put it into order and it's going to stay uh, in order. And that's why there, there's a slight wobble to the earth historically. And of course, we didn't even know that until the last few decades with our scientific ability that we can measure that stuff now. Uh, it's just a slight wobble, but that is what uh, accounts for a lot of the stuff that you're, you're hearing called climate change or global warming and all this other stuff. NASA, I don't know if you saw it or not in the news, but actually pretty much admitted as much and have said they knew for decades that all of this drama about, you know, climate change was, was really happening because of a slight wobble in the rotation. It, it's a, in other words, it's a totally normal phenomenon. And the earth isn't going to end if we don't do something big in the next 12 years. <laughs> like you're hearing in the news. 
That stuff was so idiotic and, and, and so arrogant for that matter. And young people are buying into a lot of this stuff because they're not old enough to remember that this all started a long time ago. I remember all this hair on fire reporting started back in the 70s. Only uh, it was a small fire back then. <laughs> But they, were, they started so alarming then. If we don't do this, if we don't do that, if we don't do this, we're going we're gonna to destroy all life on the planet. The, the planet's going to be destroyed, yada, yada, yada. And, and they, they would make statements like, if we don't do something within five years, well, five years came and gone, nothing changed. Then they forecasted a little, out, well, if we don't do something within 10 years, it came and went. And now, this year, they're saying 12 years. If we don't do something in 12 years, it's irreversibly, you know, done. And, but I don't know where everybody's memory is. It was just 12 years ago or so that it, we had only 10 years to do something. <laughs> and so it keeps put, putting it out and putting it out. And that's why I don't buy into all this stuff. Because the truth of the matter is, seed time and harvest is going to continue as long as the earth remains. Now, there is going to come a change. But when that change comes to the planet, it's going to come from the creator, not the creation. We are not the ones that are going to change the earth. To think that we could do that is rather arrogant uh, on our part. But that said, the Bible teaches that there is a second resurrection that's going to occur after the millennial reign. The first resurrection is the rapture of the church. And the second resurrection is something that will follow a lengthy time after that and uh, all of humanity will stand at the white throne judgment. Bring up Revelation chapter 21. And uh, I saw, John said, a new heaven and a new earth. Everybody say new. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away. And there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of the heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them, and be their God. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. Uh, and there will be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. Neither shall there be any more pain, uh, for the former things are passed away. This is the time when God sets everything in order. And he sat upon the throne. It's talking about the white throne. He said, Behold, I make all things, what? Yeah. Yell it. Yeah. Not, uh, what's the definition of new? Well, New. <laughs> Not used. <laughs> he said, I'm going I'm to renovate everything. And he said unto me, to John, he says, write these words, they're true and faithful. And he said unto me, it is done. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give unto him that is a thirst the fountain of the water of life freely, and to him that overcometh shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and they shall be my son. But the fearful and the unbelieving and the abominable and the murderers and the whoremongers and the sorcerers and idolaters and, and all liars. Man, that just wiped out the government right there. <laughs> Probably all governments. <laughs> All of them shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Now my point is simply that there is going to be a renovation of the earth. But until God decides to do it, the scripture says that seed time and harvest are going to continue pretty much. Now what about... All of the calamities that, that happened. Well, quite frankly, God is not running things yet. We're still under the power of the prince of this world. And there's still evil in the world. And God is not the source of evil in this world. Satan is the source of evil. I heard a very intelligent physicist the other day, make the comment he doesn't believe in God because he looks out and he sees so much wickedness and evil in the world. And he said, I can only conclude that if, God, if there is a God, he's not very good at it. 
Because if he was, you know, how would he allow all this stuff? Now, the truth of the matter is, for a guy who's brilliant otherwise, that's an incredibly elementary understanding about life and philosophy. And the truth of the matter is, the Word of God actually gives the answers to all that. Christianity is, is not vague in its answers to that. But God is not the source, and, and Satan is absolutely, Satan is not bound right now. I wish he were. But he is busy creating havoc in the world. And he worked his way into the thinking of mankind because of man's disobedience. That's how he gets into our thinking. Just think, if Adam and Eve had obeyed, they would have abided in the garden. Even if they didn't understand it. You don't have to understand everything to obey it. I mean, those of you who've ever had kids know that frustrating thing. You tell them to do something, and they want why? I know it helps to understand why. But sometimes when you're dealing with children, you know that they can't grasp the philosophy of this yet. And so parents in their reactive brilliance come up with a very awesome thing that just says, because I said so. <laughs> Right? We all heard it when we were young, and we all dish it out when we get older. <laughs> that might be another one of them laws of God. <laughs> but if Adam and Eve had obeyed, they would, they would still be abiding in the garden. I wonder what would have happened in the earth if they had just obeyed. And they said, well, Eve didn't understand, so she didn't obey. But you don't have to understand everything in order to obey. As a matter of fact, the, some of the greatest understanding will come through obedience not disobedience Romans 5 and 19 said for as by one man's disobedience talking about Adam many were made sinners but so by the obedience of one talking about Jesus many shall be made righteous evil came into the fallen nature of man because man started to practice this thing that we call disobedience. Because people continue to disobey. And because people continue to disobey, evil continues to grow, and it, it's made a mess out of our world. It's like a dog chasing its tail. It just keeps going in circles and circles. And Galatians 6 and 6 says, Let him that is taught in the word communicate unto him that teacheth in all good things. You know, that's an interesting little concept right there. And, and, and it's connected to where I want to go with all this. It, it says, If you have been fortunate enough to be taught well, taught practical things that can, that can get you out of these circles and cycles of life, then you need to share back your bounty with your instructor and bless those who have blessed you. And if someone has put uh, life into you and direction and correction and help into you, you need to put it back into the body of Christ. That's what it means to edify the body of Christ. That's not a controversial thing. I ought to get amens all over the house for that. And by the way, that, that a little side note here, that's the whole premise behind God's concept of tithe and offering. He said, if we have sowed unto you spiritual things, Paul said, it is a great thing if we reap your carnal things. And I've joked a lot of times, he was talking about finance. He was not talking about carnality. Too many have paid me back <laughs> with actual carnality. <laughs> That gets old. The very next verse, verse 7. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. You're not, you can ridicule all you want. You can make all the faces you want. You can roll your eyebrows all you want. But know this. Whatsoever a man, I might add, or a woman soweth that shall he also what yell it for he that soweth to his flesh because of this law shall of the flesh reap corruption 
But if you sow to the Spirit, you shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. In other words, I'm going to say it this way. You're going to catch what you chase. You want to chase after sin? Don't worry, you'll catch it. But then you get in trouble because then it catches you. Then you get like the guy that's holding the wolf by the ears. You can't afford to hold on. You can't afford to let go. <laughs> Verse 9. And let us not be weary in well-doing. For in how long? Come on, everybody. We shall reap. If what? If we faint not. As we have opportunity, therefore, let us do good unto all men, especially them of the household of faith. My point is, it's a law of God. It's the law of sowing and reaping. It goes back to everything that, that I, I was started with tonight that goes back to the garden. Here's the law of God. If you plant corn, you're going to reap corn. Not green beans. Unless you bought the wrong packet. <laughs> but here's the deal. You're not getting corn just because, you know, you, you know, planted corn. But you're getting it because it's a law of God. Seed time and harvest will remain in order. God said, I'm not going to rearrange the planet again for man's sake until the end. Can you imagine how crazy it would be if you never knew what you're going to reap? <laughs> if you plant your garden in the springtime and then just cross your fingers, <laughs> hoping you get something. God, don't let it be lima beans, please, not lima beans. <laughs> or whatever is your thing. <laughs> No, but, but you don't have to worry about it because, because that kind of chaos doesn't happen to us. Whatever you sow, you reap. Everybody say right. But here's what you need to know. That's the exact same law that gives sinners sorrow and death when he sins. It's the same law that brings joy and peace to the children of God. Over time, because God obeys his own laws, and as a result, the universe abides in him. And you and I can determine to a great deal what we're going to reap in life by making choices of what we're going to sow. And the reason we can do it is because seed time and harvest remain. So if you and I consistently obey God's word, we will abide in him. If we abide in him, we will bear fruit. If a person will obey God, things will work into his favor in time. And I'm underlining that in time. It, it's not always an overnight thing. Some things grow quick. Some things take time. It just depends on what you... And sometimes the things that are really important in life are things that don't bloom and blossom overnight. Sometimes they take the investment of years. But on the same token, if I disobey God, and God's laws, then I'm flying in the face of the rules of the entire universe around me. Hence, a lot of the difficulties and the drama that we find ourselves in. Because if a person will obey God, it works in time. If he disobeys God, those same principles will work against him. And again, I say, in time. Now, there are times when you will, you will obey God and it will, for a season at first, bring difficulty. And that's because Satan wants to do everything he can to talk us out of being obedient. And he'll throw all kinds of stuff at us. We call those things trials, by the way. 
And there are trials of our faith. It's are we going to have faith in the laws of God? Or are we just going to judge things by what we see with our natural eye? Paul and Silas were obeying God. And they went to Philippi, ended up in jail. That's not supposed to happen. <laughs> but you can't always say that just because you're obeying that everything always works smoothly. There are trials that come along. Of course, by the same token, God oftentimes gets involved in them and, and turns them. By the end of that story, there was a Philippian jailer that was getting saved and his whole family being baptized in Jesus' name. So that's worth an evening. <laughs> Bring up 1 Peter 4 real quick. Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened unto you. But you wouldn't believe how many conversations I've had through the years. People say, but, I, but, I'm, but I'm trying to do right. and I'm, oh, I got this and that and that. Oh, okay. Take a breath. Read the book. What's he say to do when that's... A, now, this one's hard. It takes a long time to learn this one. He said, but rejoice! <laughs> In so much as you are a partaker of Christ's sufferings, that, now what, when his glory shall be revealed, you'll be glad with exceeding joy. And if you be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are ye, for the spirit of glory and of God resteth upon you. On their part he is evil spoken of, but on your part he is glorified. Now he explains it. This is almost like, a, okay, by the way, let none of you suffer as a murderer, or as a thief, or as an evildoer. Most of you are thinking, I'm doing pretty good so far. <laughs> I bet, you, I bet you this one might catch you. <laughs> or a busybody. <laughs> In other men's matters. <laughs> Rut row. <laughs> Yet if any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed. Let him glorify God in this behalf. He's, he's, he's wanting us to understand that sometimes the drama and the stuff we're going through some of it, not all of it, is because of Christ. Some of it is because of El Stupido. <laughs> Making less than brilliant choices about phone things. And you can't, you've got to discern the difference between the two. Because if you get to blaming God for the stuff you did, you end up like the physicist who can, who can, he, he can explain the stars. But you can't figure out the simplest thing of, of life. There is no God because there's evil. Oh. Two kingdoms exist and two kingdoms are going to clash. That's why the Bible calls the church the children of obedience. And it calls the world the children of disobedience. Now we know Romans 8, bring it up, we know this, all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to His purpose. It's been said a thousand times, it did not say that everything that happens is good, but it says God will get to it. It's a law. You planted corn, but the first thing out of the ground is not corn. It's a leaf. And sometimes the rabbits get it before you do. <laughs> and it's not fair to watch for weeks as this little thing's growing. And think, I, this, I can't eat this. <laughs> this isn't what I planted. Yes, it is. Just abide long enough. Well, how do I abide? I'm running out of patience. Ah. <laughs> then 
just obey for a while. And that'll, that'll make you stick. Even when you're sitting out in the yard trying to figure out where the corn is. Do you ever notice that everything in God's creation <laughs> obeys him except us? And the irony is we have the most to gain by obeying him, and we have the most to lose if we don't. And yet we're the one that have the most difficulty in doing it. And the truth is, for those of us who do obey him, let me tell you something. There's, there, there's headaches sometimes that go along with that. But I want you to know, at the end of the day, we are well compensated. Well compensated. For the stuff that we went through that, that, that was kind of bigger than us. Creation doesn't seem to think about questioning him but us we do and I want to remind you I felt the Holy Ghost just quicken me I want to remind you something the Bible I, I'm, I'm so I, I'm tired of I, it's got to be getting close to my retirement time because I, I'm finding myself getting irritated at stuff that <laughs> It's hard walking with God. What part exactly? Let me tell you what the word says. The way of a transgressor is what's hard. Well, I don't know. My neighbor's a transgressor. And man, he seems to be having a great time. Partying it up and doing it. Uh-huh. Yeah. But he hasn't, he hadn't gotten to the corn yet. He's still playing in the leaves. But he has not fully reaped yet. When it's all said and done, there is no one that has obeyed Christ that's going to be standing off to the side questioning whether or not it was worth it. No, 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 no. Only mankind ultimately disobeys God outside of the, the angels that did. But it, it, it's because it's all about the act of the will. And by the way, this is why obeying is what produces abiding. And why abiding is what produces fruit. Because obedience requires an act of the will. And we do not obey... Simply by thinking about it. Well, I think about God's will. Yeah, but do you actually submit yourself to it? Bring up James 1. Wherefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. For the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. In other words, you start getting angry about everything, you're going to misstep. You're going to say things you regret. You're going to do things you regret. Wherefore, lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness and receive with meekness the engrafted word that's able to save your souls. Now here is how you engraft it. Be ye doers of the word and not hearers only. Because if you're just a hearer, if you're just a Bible reader and not a Bible obeyer, you're deceiving your own selves. For if any be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he's like unto a man that beholds his natural face in the glass, talking about a mirror. He beholds himself, goes his way, straightway forget what manner of man he was. In other words, it's how you look, you know, when you first wake up in the morning. <laughs> and you look in the mirror and say, good to go. <laughs> if you're not going to do anything about it, why have the mirror? <laughs> because the only purpose of the mirror was not to show you how pretty you think you are, <laughs> but it's rather to show you what, what needs to be adjusted. <laughs> 
Jesus taught us in the garden. And we have to follow his instruction. There are times in our life we absolutely simply have to say, not my will, but thine be done. And whenever God's will conflicts with our will, we have a choice. And whatever we do with that choice is when we're sowing. We're either sowing to our flesh or we're sowing to the Spirit. And that is no one else's fault. It is no one else's account. There's no one else to be blamed at this point. And good thoughts in the mind or good feelings in the heart do not make up for disobedience. Some people really struggle with the idea that God would correct them because they're a nice guy. I mean, I, I like people. I'm, I'm a good guy. None of that has anything to do with obedience. It's like getting pulled over on 64 doing 95 mile an hour. But you know, officer, I really feel bad about this. And honest to Pete, I was really thinking about the speed limit and I was even thinking to myself just a few miles back, you know, I really ought to slow down here. I need to. You know. Uh-huh. And the officer will be shaking his head and mumbling the whole time. <laughs> right? <laughs> because feeling good about it or having a happy thought about what I ought to be doing does not take the place of actually doing it. We don't get extra points for just thinking we should have done something. I think too many people settle for a, a mental Christian experience. They'll, they'll even study doctrine, or they'll study theological terms. They just never really get around to applying it, doing it. That's why at times I'm frustrated with the, the general doctrine that is out in Christian circles that just says a simple confession of faith just simply sets all things right and secures your salvation. That's not accurate. Because a confession, uh, just simply a, a, a statement, I believe in, in Jesus. Well, the Bible says that even devils believe in the Lord. It doesn't save them. And it's not going to save us either. Because there has to be with that a true repentance. And repentance is not confession. It all begins with confession. But it's got to lead me to repentance. Repentance is a change of mind. I choose to change this. I choose to stop this. It's an oversimplification to tell people that all you got to do is say a sinner's prayer and everything is... Is justified because it has left a lot of people, and I think caused them oftentimes to backslide because it left them powerless. And when things rose up against them, many times they just couldn't figure. I don't know where, where's the power that I heard of. Where's the? Well, that's where you start to get into some issues of the spirit. And as Pentecostals know, emotions and uh, feelings are an important part of our experience with God, but they really have little to do with whether or not we're going to obey God. Because at the center of our walk with God, I don't care how much you shout on Sunday night, the bottom line is you're going to have to figure out how to, how to stretch Sunday into the rest of the week. But sometimes we don't obey God 
because, well, we just don't feel like it. But the truth is, obeying him is not an issue of how we feel about it. It's an issue of why we do it. We obey him not because we feel like it. We obey him because we decided that it's right. It's like Wolford Brimley eating oatmeal. It's the right thing to do. <laughs> Handful of you know who that is. <laughs> we got to graduate from obeying God's word just because we feel like it or don't feel like it. But rather, it's because, no, I'm going to obey it. It doesn't matter how I feel about it. And sometimes it's not always pleasant. But it's right. It's right. And I have to activate my will. Remember Jonah? Yeah, he finally obeyed God. But boy, he drug his feet for a while. Bring up Ephesians 6. Servants... Be obedient to them who are of your masters according to the flesh with fear and trembling and singleness of heart as unto Christ. Now again, we've talked about this before. He was referring to uh, the, the, the economy of their day was, was uh, indentured servanthood. It's not the same thing as this kind of slavery that we experienced in America. Nevertheless, you take these same principles and put them into our day and many times in what he's talking about, masters and servants, we could interchange the words employer and employees. Well, I really messed some of your evenings up with that one. <laughs> because now all of a sudden he's saying, be obedient to your boss with singleness of heart, like you're doing it unto Christ. I'm going to... I'm going to clip a little version of this out and send it to all my staff and employees. <laughs> In case they missed us. Not with eye service as men pleasers, but as servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart, with good will, doing service as to the Lord and not to men, knowing that. Now here's why, here's why he advised it. Here's why it's good advice. Knowing that whatsoever good thing any man doeth, the same shall he receive of the Lord, whether he be bond or free. In other words, act right because it is right. And even if people around you aren't acting right, God will make sure that you reap what you sowed. And when you try to be obedient by choice, someone will always come along in your family or friends or whatever and say, oh, that's crazy. That's, that's cultic. That's controlling. You know what I've noticed? That stuff is never said by a submitted person. Everybody that always pulls that card is not a submitted person that says it. Jesus used himself as an example. Bring up John 15, 10. If you keep my commandments, you shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments and I abide in his love. He said, I did it. That's why he has the right to ask us to do it. John 4 and 33. Therefore said the disciples one to another, Hath any man bought him to eat? Jesus said unto them, My meat is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. I am not here to just enjoy life. I'm not here just to party. I'm not here for hedon hedonistic reasons. I'm not here just to go fishing and golf and have fun. I'm here to do his will. That's why he is able to ask us to follow his example. John 5 and 30. I can of my own self do nothing. As I hear, I judge. And my judgment is just because I seek not my own will, but the will of the Father which has, has sent me. Hear me tonight. Hear me. If you, if you don't hear anything else, hear this. Don't ever, you don't ever have to feel sorry for someone that has given their life to the cause of Christ. Don't you dare feel sorry for them. 
they didn't miss anything that they're not going to be extremely well compensated for. You see, less committed people never understand those that are <laughs> more committed. It's bizarre to them. It's like looking at modern art. <laughs> what is it? <laughs> I don't understand it. And then once your obedience, when you start getting serious about obeying Jesus and it starts affecting your life and, the, and the, the stuff really, start, I mean, it really starts changing you, they'll get really concerned about you. And they want to know, what's wrong? You okay? I've had parents that got upset because their teenagers got the Holy Ghost at church. And I'm thinking, and, and matter of fact, one of them not too long ago, was, was somebody was telling me, about a conversation with a mother that asked him if you would reach out to my daughter again. Well, he, he did. He brought her to church. Lord filled her with the Holy Ghost, if I remember the story right. But mom steps in, wants to stop all that. Uh, I don't want him in that cold. I don't want him in it. Yeah, well, guess what? You know what the key to David's success was? Psalms 40. I delight to do thy will. Oh, my God, yea, the law is within my heart. Even when he messed up, he'd find his way back. Because when it was said and done, he wanted to obey God. And the man Christ Jesus was tempted in all points, and he never allowed others to turn him away from the will of God. And I say to us tonight, don't let anyone try to pull you away from the will of God in your life. They are not doing you a favor. Mm. Remember the response that Jesus gave Peter? Bring up Matthew 16. When he's telling him he didn't have to go to the cross. Be it far from thee, O Lord. This shall not be unto thee. Now, again, as I preached recently, he was... He'd seen him on the Mount of Transfiguration. You're really the Christ. Hey, Jesus, you're the Messiah. You know what that means? That means you get to do anything you want to do. Because that's how we interpret power. We think power and freedom is to be able to do whatever we want to do. And that means I don't have to do whatever I don't want to have to do. That's why President Bush back in the 90s, you know, he didn't like broccoli and he, he banned it from Air Force One. That's a serious dislike. Most people just say, no, I don't care for it. But he banned it from the whole plane. <laughs> Reporters are getting on to him. And finally, in frustration, I'll never forget, it was so funny. He looked and he said, look, I don't like broccoli. I've hated it since I was a kid. And today I'm the president of the United States and I don't have to eat it if I don't want to. <laughs> and that's kind of how we interpret power. Because you're the Christ, you don't have to do anything you don't want to do. But Jesus understood that the truth was the exact opposite. That's why he looked at him and, and looked right past Peter, went right to the heart of it. Get behind me, Satan. You're an offense to me. You savor us not the things that be of God. All you care about is your own agenda. See, here's the deal. Because he was the Messiah, meant he had to go to the cross. He did it exactly because of who he was. And there was a time when his flesh was rising up and questioning it. Father, if it's possible, if there's any other way, let this cup pass before me. He wasn't an idiot. He didn't want this. There was nothing in Jesus that wanted this. But it was a choice that he made because I'm here to do the will of God. And there's too many people in the house of God 
that think that people that spend their time doing the will of God are wasting their time. And you need a revelation. You need your eyes opened up. You need to see things the way Jesus sees them. Just because we're free in the Spirit doesn't give us the liberty to do whatever it is our flesh wants to do. It's the exact opposite. Because of who we are, there are some things that are required of us. But it's well compensated. And Jesus lost everything to obey the Father. But because he obeyed, he abided. And because he abided, he bore fruit. And that fruit has remained. And he ended up reaping what he sowed. He lost everything. But then he gained everything. Never to lose it again, I might add. Verse 23. Turn and say, get thee behind me. I quoted this one already. Verse 24. If any man will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, follow me. Don't let anyone talk you out of obedience. Whosoever will lose his life, Excuse me, will save his life, shall lose it. Whosoever shall lose his life for my sake shall find it. What's a man profit if he gain the whole world and lose his own soul? What shall a man give in exchange for his soul? That famous discourse was all about the issue of whether or not we're going to obey God's will. Verse, uh, I'm sorry, Philippians chapter 2, if you'd bring it up real quick. Talking about Jesus said, But he made himself of no reputation. And he took upon him the form of a servant. And was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled... Who? Because that's the only one that we have authority over. And when he humbled himself, he became obedient unto death even the death of the cross because of that God hath highly exalted him and give him a name that's above every name and when this thing's said and done you need to know this at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow things in heaven and earth things under the earth none of that could happen if he had disobeyed. And too many of us are practicing day-to-day disobedience and walking around wondering where the blessings of God are. It's because you haven't abided. And when you're not abiding, you can't bear fruit. People, for some reason, we all do it. We tend to do everything we can to avoid Obedience. And yet, it's the, it's the very key to the blessings of God. You can call me a control freak if you want, but I've been endeavoring to teach you as best as I know it, the whole counsel of God all these years. And one of these days, there are people that have sat under it, walked away from it, because they've allowed others to talk them out of it for various reasons, that we'll wake up to it. But my fear is going to be that it's going to be too late. Can I remind you, bring up 1 Samuel 15. King Saul tried to substitute a sacrifice for obedience, but he was in direct violation of the word of God. And so Samuel comes and said, Hath the Lord is great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying. Everybody say obeying. The voice of the Lord. Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice. Well, I'm sacrificing because this, yeah, but obedience is better. Here's why. Because rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. Stubbornness is an iniquity and an idolatry. And because you've rejected the word of the Lord... He has also rejected thee from being king. And Saul tried to backpedal and tried to fix it and try to change it, but 
It was too late. The corn popped open. The reaping and the sowing was done. And he lost the kingdom. Matthew 21, Jesus, given his parable of the sons, he said, What think ye? A certain man had two sons, and he came to the first, and he said, Son, go to work today in my vineyard. And he answered and said, I will not. That sounds like a son, doesn't it? (laughs) But afterward, watch this. But afterward, he repented and went. I made a dumb decision. You know, I'm going to fix this. I'm going to go. I'm going to straighten it out. And even though he didn't feel right about it, he obeyed. And then he came to the second and said, likewise. And he answered and said, I go, sir. And went not. (laughs) Boy, those people are frustrating. (laughs) They're always talking a big game. They know how to talk the talk, have no clue how to walk the walk. They're always telling you how they're going to do this and do that and do this and the other. But they're legends in their own mind. (laughs) Because they never get around to obeying. So Jesus said in verse 31, Which of them did the will of the Father? And they said, Well, the first. And Jesus said to them, Verily I say unto you, that the publicans and the harlots will go into the kingdom of God before you. And John came unto the way of righteousness, and you believed him not. But the, the publicans and the harlots believed him. And ye, when you had seen it, repented not afterward that you might believe in him. Let me tell you something. For any of, any of us that have ever sat on apostolic pews, ever had the Holy Ghost, ever been baptized in Jesus' name, ever been taught the word, that go wandering out in the foolishness of this world. I want to tell you, your biggest nightmare is hoping you don't end up standing next to somebody that came out of this crazy world and found their way into this kingdom. And they're rejoicing at what they have. They're finally obeying, but you're disobeying. And finally, of course, the parable of talents, Matthew 25, verse 25. The man tried to substitute excuses for obedience. He said, look, I I was afraid. I went and hid my talent in the earth. And lo, that's where it's been, all this. And here it is, it's yours. And the Lord answered and said, Thou wicked and slothful servant, you knew that I reap where I sowed not, and I gather where I have not strowed. In other words, he said, You know I was expecting return on my investment. You ought to have, therefore, put my money to the exchangers, and then at my coming I should have received my own with usury. Take there the talent from him, and give it to him that hath ten talents. For unto every one that hath shall it be given, and to him that hath abundance, or, or, excuse me, and he shall have abundance. Did you see that? But from him that hath not shall be taken away even that which he has. And cast the unprofitable servant into outer darkness, where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth. This is why socialism never works. Because all the efforts that you endeavor to make to make everybody even, it don't last because of the law of sowing and reaping. And people that sow right and reap right, they'll reap right. And that's why some people continue to get more and other people continue to lose everything. And it's cyclical. God's people should want to obey him in order to abide in him. And just know, if I can abide in him, it will produce fruit. And the blessings of God are not a reward for obedience. It's the fruit of abiding. It is not God loving you more than your neighbor. It is fair. God said sowing and reaping works for everybody. Adam and Eve did not abide in the garden because they didn't obey. Israel disobeyed God and they lost their whole nation for 
a season after. One, one last scripture. Bring up uh, Deuteronomy 11. And everything that happened to Israel, by the way, was very fair because God told them right up front in the beginning, Deuteronomy eleven twenty six. Behold, I set before you this day a blessing and a curse. A blessing, everybody say blessing. <laughs> if you what? Obey. obey the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you to say. Or I also set before you a curse if you will not obey. The commandments of the Lord your God. But turn aside out of the way which I command you this day to go after other gods which you have not known. You see, we tend to try to blame God or blame the church or pastors or whoever for things that quite honestly most of the time were created by our own disobedience. The Lord says to all of us, I set before you a blessing or curse. That's not predestinated. You choose. Which do you want? Because of the law of sowing and reaping. Obedience releases power. The farmer that works the field right releases the power of that harvest. Our problem is that there's something twisted in our nature that constantly keeps us wanting to not obey. We... We just always want to do things our way. And something inside of us says, I, don't tell me what to do. You know, it's like somebody standing there trying to hand you $500. Don't you try to give me any money. <laughs> Anybody can look at that and think, are you Okay. But yet, people that will dispense to us righteous judgment and good godly counsel, disp dispensing it to you, it's the same thing. Here's, here's $500. Here's something that will bless you. Here's something that will... Don't you tell me! <laughs> tell me how to live. Don't tell me how to... You know, well, you know, excuse me, but you do understand that was the whole point of the book. <laughs> was to tell us how to live. <laughs> and if you are so arrogant that you can't even accept that point, then all I can tell you is go ahead. As a child of disobedience, sooner or later, you'll reap it. But if you ever decide that you get tired of the foolishness and the drama, <laughs> then start obeying. Stand with me tonight. <laughs> Praise God. I don't know whether to say, oh me or oh my. <laughs> but I know I feel a beautiful presence of the Lord in here because this is the truth of His Word. <laughs> Lift up your voice, if you will, and just give God praise in this house. Dear Jesus, we love you. Hallelujah. Lord, we thank you for the people of God that have come tonight. And I thank you for this Word. I loose this teaching tonight into the body. In the glorious name of Jesus. And everybody said amen. The key of all of life is bearing fruit. The key to bearing fruit is abiding. The key to abiding is obeying. It works. God bless you. You're dismissed in the name of the Lord. We'll see you this weekend. Have a great night. Be careful out there in case it's icy. God bless you.